Okay, thank you all for joining us this morning. Um, we are going to get the show on the road here, and uh, this is um, going to be the, the first half of our Flex to uh, Crystal training, uh, where we're going to go up the, go over the setup and use of Flex to Crystal. Um, our uh, agenda for this morning is uh, we're going to go over the, the components required to get this running. We're, we are going to take a look at the test report and also at uh, converting a report. We're going to take a look at some of the issues related to advanced connection handling. And uh, then we're also going to look at the, the licensing issues involved, especially with, uh, with the SAP licensing more, to, more than the Flex Crystal licensing. Um, and then uh, we're also going to take a look at the deployment of Flex to Crystal. So we're going we're gonna to take you from uh, cradle to grave, so to speak, with this. So the first thing that we're going to go over here, uh, I just want to mention a couple of things related to uh, how Flex to Crystal has, has fixed a couple of items uh, in comparison to the, uh, the data access RDC classes that are in place. Um, and really, this is, this is, these issues are due to um, mostly operating system changes that have occurred. Um, so the first issue here uh, was reported to us, and, and we've tested this with, with Flex to Crystal along with the RDC classes and been able to duplicate this. If you're using code jock skinning on your application where you're able to, to give it a, a, a theme where you theme your application, on Windows 7, if you're using the RDC classes with Crystal uh, XI, um, the scroll bar on uh, the uh, preview for Crystal doesn't work correctly. If you do the exact same thing using the Flex Crystal classes with the newer um, viewer that, that's in uh, Crystal Reports 2011, that bug goes away. So um, you know that that may be something that some of you have to deal with if you're using any of the skinning on your application, um, and we haven't been able to find any fix for the older version um, uh, of uh, of RDC with that. So Flex Crystal does fix that issue. The next one here is uh, uh, fixes table catalog issue. Now th this is something that's been there's a couple of threads in the news group about this. Uh, in the Crystal News Group, where users that are using like Connect, um, where they use the connection string uh, to change the data source on their Crystal reports, are having this issue. Although they're also having it when using the connection properties class, where basically all of the tables have a table catalog on them uh, that is linked to the wrong catalog, which is the uh, is the actual database on the database server that that you uh, hit when you're using. Microsoft SQL, um, and the tables won't take the uh, the new database name other than the first table. So the first table will properly be linked to a different database server if you're doing dynamic connections, um, but none of the rest of the tables will. This isn't something that happens for everybody, but uh, some users have uh, have this happen, and Flex to Crystal fixes this. Um, using a different method. We'll actually take a look later uh, during our advanced connection handling section at, um, at how you change that, uh, the connection dynamically. And uh, of course, this issue goes away there. And the one other thing of note that, uh, that has been added, I mean, there's all kinds of new features, but one of them that, that some users are finding, uh, or some developers are finding useful is this dump settings feature that you can call on a table. Um, and again, this is in relation to the connection. If you look at a Microsoft SQL connection, there are just a huge number of settings on it. And uh, um, some of those settings turn on and off advanced features related to the character set used or stuff related to timeouts. And, and literally on a, uh, on a Microsoft SQL uh, connection, there may be uh, 30 settings, somewhere in that range, and this dump settings feature allows you to see what all of those settings currently are. And in fact, with Flex to Crystal, you're able to change all of those settings. So, um, and that's something that in the RDC you didn't have access to that level of detail. So, 
Next up, we, uh, we're actually going to get started with this. Uh, of course, the, uh, you'll need to have Crystal Reports 2011 uh, already installed. That is a somewhat large download, so, so we're not actually going to go through installing that piece. Uh, but we are going to actually run the Flex to Crystal installer, and of course, you'll need to have BDF installed. And uh, this last item here, uh, I want to spend just a moment on here. The Flex to Crystal installer um, adds a what's called the Visual Studio 2010 Crystal Reports runtime. And so you have to, uh, if the Flex Crystal installer mentions that you need to have that on there, um, you need to make sure that prerequisite is allowed to go through for the installation to work correctly. Uh, Crystal Reports 2011 actually does not install a runtime engine at all. Uh, so, and we'll talk about that a little bit later uh, during the licensing. But uh, that component is required uh, to actually run reports from uh, BDF or from .NET, for instance. So let's go ahead and get started on that. Let me switch over to my machine here. OK, so we're going to start from scratch. Go ahead and install Flex to Crystal. OK. So as we go through here, I'm just going to pick all the defaults. And uh, there's, there's actually a dialog. If you've installed Flex Crystal before and you're still using a, um, uh, if you're on the eval, uh, there's something of note here. Uh, the installation right now has a dialog that's popped up behind it. I'm going to drag it over here that lets you know how many days left or uh, how many days you have left on your eval. And so that's a dialog that's popped up in the background. And uh, um, so you just, you know, if that, if that comes up here, you just need to clear that, letting you know what you have here. We're going to uncheck the readme, but we are going to launch Flex Crystal here. Um, in my case, I already had the, uh, the runtime installed, so it didn't even bring up uh, that option for me. So. Pull this up here. Okay, so here's our VDF 16.1 after we've got uh, Flex2 Crystal installed here. And we're actually already selected into the workspace we need. So next up, we, uh, we're actually going to run this test report that comes with it. And the installer has linked the um, uh, library for Flex2 Crystal that has uh, uh, all of the pieces that you'll need in it to whatever version of VDF your uh, workspace files are associated with. So in my case, that was 16.1. So 16.1 came up. Uh, if you have an older version of VDF that your SWS files are associated with, that's what's going to come up. Um, and uh, one of the things to note here is that when that workspace opens on older versions of VDF, you may actually get a uh, a couple of errors related to data dictionaries. And of course, the Flex Crystal library doesn't use data dictionaries, but it's essentially impossible um, uh, to make a library that is compatible with, uh, fully compatible with VDF 12.1 to 16.1. It works on all versions, but on older versions, you may see some errors related to DDs. And uh, unfortunately, there's no way we can get rid of those, but it, they actually don't affect anything. So if you see those, you can ignore them. The test app will still run just fine. So we're going to go ahead and run that now. Okay, and uh, you'll notice is as uh, after this is compiled here. Bring it over to the correct screen okay, and run the report. Uh, you'll notice that the report came up really fast. In fact, it came up faster than Flex Crystal has come up in prior versions even. And this is this is due to a change that we made. Um, and we're actually going to go over that change in just a moment here. So we know that the uh, test report is up and running. So now we're going to take a look at this at the test app a little bit and, and see what, what it contains. Um, right off the bat, the test report uses 
CDO, uh, the older crystal data object implementation. And it also uses ADO.NET and tests that implementation. Uh, it also makes use of a custom active X viewer. So rather than using the, the default viewer that is a separate view that pops up when you run a report, which is how most users are going to use it, um, this one embeds the, the viewer into uh, the view itself. So it demonstrates that technique. And this last item here is what I had mentioned before, the startup preload. Um, so this is, uh, let's actually just switch over and start taking a look at that. So I'm going to go in here and open up our view and close some of this stuff. Okay, so the uh, first off to, to look at this preload, it, this is actually in the crystal test. Um, .src file. What we've done, and this, this issue related to uh, the first report taking a, uh, longer to run than others, is something that is, is widespread with Crystal in, in the .NET environment in general. In fact, um, this technique that we're using was a, is a technique that we picked up from uh, uh, users of, of just the straight .NET product with, with ways that they make the system start faster. And so what we've done here, if I go to the bottom, uh, we've augmented procedure activating on the uh, main panel here. And uh, procedure activating only gets called once. And if you'll notice here, what we've done is we've actually created a uh, flex to crystal object. And we've told it to open a blank report. And literally, this is an RPT that you we went in and created new and just hit save on it and saved it into our data folder. Um, and we open that RPT, and then we close it and destroy the object so we've cleaned up. And of course, we also um, uh, check the crystal environment beforehand to make sure everything's OK. And what this does is it moves the startup time to the application startup time. So if you have a splash screen on your application, for instance, this will make that splash screen stay up a little bit longer when your app starts. But it makes those reports run really, really fast. Um, and so it pushes that delay to the beginning of your application. And so we're actually looking at other techniques that, that in future versions may end up uh, uh, improving it also. But for now, this, this really helps. And it's a very simple piece of code that you can copy into your application. Uh, also on the preview here, if we uh, want to take just a quick look at some of the other stuff that we're doing here, um, you'll notice that we uh, are using the CDO here. And the CDO is, in our case, the data source is an XML file. Um, and uh, you can see here that the CDO use is very simple. We create a CDO for the report. We get our XML data. We append the CDO data to the report. And then we destroy it afterwards. And in fact, we're using for, uh, for ADO.NET, we have this one line. Uh, assign ADO data sources. And uh, then we have very similar code for ADO here, which uh, loads the XML data and then adds a row onto the table. And uh, that's how we handle ADO. So we're going to be going over this in a lot more detail in part two. But you can actually take a look at the test report here to, to get a handle on a lot of the um, basic techniques for some of this stuff. and. Uh, the one last item, of course, that we have in here, you'll notice if I switch over, that um, we have the, the actual preview embedded in the report in this case, like I had mentioned. And uh, that's just an object on the class palette that you can drag on. Um, and the only thing that's required to use this is actually in the crystal report after we've dragged it on during on display report. We just send a signed preview object and pass the crystal report along. So same technique that, that's been used before. Um, this code should, should move over just fine if you were doing this in your uh, RDC-based apps. So let's switch back over here, presentation. And uh, next up, we're going to actually convert our first report in a different workspace. So uh, after we open up the workspace, we have to add the Flex to Crystal library uh, into that workspace. And then we're going to do a real simple conversion using, a, uh, using search and replace 
and uh, just a couple of tiny edits and we'll be done. Let's go over and convert a report. Uh, so we're going to switch over to an example workspace here. And uh, we are going to use, out of the order entry example, we're going to use the address labels um, report. And there's a specific reason I'm using this one. Um, right off the bat, it's a, it's a fairly simple report. It uses the CDO. Um, but the other reason to use this report is if, if you're following along, you'll know um, Flex to Crystal, of course, doesn't support the embedded database. Uh, it only will work with database servers. And if you haven't had time uh, yet to convert, for instance, the order entry over to a, to a database server and you're not using one of your, following along with one of your own reports, the, um, the address labels uh, report doesn't use the embedded database at all. It uses just a CDO data source. So you actually don't need to have converted um, everything over to uh, a, a database server yet to, to convert this report. So that's why I chose this one. Uh, so you can follow along on that if you're uh, using the order entry just with Dataflex files. So we're going to do a couple of quick search and replaces here. Dialog always comes up on the other screen. So we're going to replace check for crystal, check for flex to crystal, and replace all. And on this first line here, we have to remove that piece right there. And then we are going to replace C crystal with C flex to crystal. And these two will take care of uh, pretty much everything in your application. If, if you're using other packages, for instance, um, you may need to go in there and add the flex to do the search and replace for the flex to. But if we scroll down here and take a look, we'll see that that has, has taken care of our actual um, class that the report is based on here. And uh, it's also taking care of the check crystal environment here, where we have check for flex to crystal now right in here. And uh, on most reports, that's what you're going to have. You're going to have some classes possibly in here related to parameters. Uh, and you're going to have the check for flex to crystal. And you're going to have the main crystal report. So let's save this. And we're going to give it a run. Oh, you'll see I've missed a step. OK, we forgot the very first step here. So let's go in and do this. We've converted our report. We forgot to add the library. Let's go in and add the library here. So the library is installed under your documents area. You can see I've got a lot of libraries in my documents area. But it will install a Mertech Data Systems Flex to Crystal Lib folder here. And uh, inside of that, you just pick the SWS. And it'll bring up this dialog here um, asking you if you want to use relative pathing. And uh, in most cases, you're want, going to want to get yes to this instead of um, absolute pathing. If you know you need absolute pathing on it, of course, you can do that. But we're just going to hit relative. OK. So now that's added the library association onto this workspace, which I should have done before. And now we should be good to go on this. OK. Over here, I've got it bringing up the, uh, the login, because this is a converted application order entry here. OK, so now we're going to go to address labels. And we're going to run it just with a couple here. Now, if you notice here, we have a, a delay running this application. This application, since it is a freshly converted one here, does not have the activating code that uh, the test app has. So we had that delay that you had to experience the first time through running the application um, to, to get the, uh, the Flex to Crystal to actually, uh, or the crystalreports.net engine to actually load correctly. 
So that's why that activating is important. It gets rid of that delay. This report would run instantaneous. And in fact, if we go in and run the report again, we'll see that uh, we get the load up coming up faster when we do this here. Um, and uh, you'll see here on this report, we've got identical to what you would expect on the Crystal XI, a couple of the uh, uh, little items related to uh, how things outline have changed a little bit, but in general, that's pretty much it. We've converted a report. This report is completely good to go now. Let's close this out and switch over. So that's, that's converting a report. It should be just as easy for you. Um, Got to make sure that you add that Flex Crystal Library uh, step I missed on there. Um, and, uh, and then, of course, those quick search and replaces, and, and that's it. So next up, we're, we're going to talk about something in there that not all developers are using, this check crystal environment. Um, and we really advise that you use this. I know not everyone does, um, but it, it really is important uh, from the standpoint of uh, we're expecting you to use it with Flex to Crystal. And right off the bat, the, uh, the check crystal environment confirms that flex to crystal has its license uh, properly uh, installed and set up, that it's not expired, and uh, it, it also makes sure that the flex to crystal environment is installed correctly. And uh, more importantly, the second item here, it keeps the app from crashing if an undefined flex to crystal condition exists. So basically, if, if you aren't doing this and Crystal is, for some reason, in a bad state, um, if your Crystal isn't installed properly or, for instance, Flex to Crystal isn't installed properly, um, you'll just load on data flex errors that come up one after the other. Um, and the Check Crystal environment was meant to, to fix that. And uh, so it, it's important to call that. It allows you to detect that condition and deal with it beforehand. Uh, so that you're not having to uh, deal with the myriad of errors that you'll get. Um, and you can see here, it's actually very simple to use. You know, turn this over so we see everything. Um, it, it, it's really a, a very simple little piece of code that you can put in here. It just fits right around your run report. You start by calling it. And uh, it returns whether or not it's OK. And by calling it, it also sets up, uh, if there was a problem, it stores that in a dialog <clears throat> so that you can um, then display what the problem is uh, if there is a problem. So for instance, if my eval had expired, uh, that, would, that would come up in this case. Or if my, uh, my license, uh, for some reason, was wrong, or I had copied in a uh, a flex to SQL license instead of my uh, flex to crystal license, for instance, um, it, it's going to detect that and uh, and bring up the dialog here, letting me know that that's the wrong license. So uh, you know it's very useful to have that around there. Um, if you don't have it around there, you can get 50, 60 errors. So something we advise you to do, very simple to do, and uh, will really save you some trouble if if you do have a problem with. Uh, your crystal environment for some reason. OK, so next up, we're going to get into some stuff related to advanced connection handling. Um, for most users, the way they're going to um, do their connections, if, if you're a, uh, an ISV, you'll most likely be using the uh, advanced connection handling features. If, uh, if you're just in-house, it's very possible that your crystal reports um, have the database server that they're going to access predefined in them, and, and you may never touch this piece. Uh, in fact, you may have even the uh, username and password login predefined in your Crystal reports. For those that don't, um, there is, uh, there's a few methods to, to make note of, and some of these are different than the RDC interface, and that's one of the reasons we mention it. Uh, right off the bat, if you need to change, uh, if you need to change the username and password on a report. So your database is correct on the report, just your username and password is different. Um, 
a uh, lot of shops choose to have their database server always named the same so that all they have to do is this. In this case, there's two possible calls you may need to use. The first one takes just the username and password combo and will change uh, or will apply that username and password to uh, the entire report. The second one um, actually takes four parameters. It takes the username and password, but it also takes the database name and the server name. And uh, that one you would use if for some reason your report is accessing multiple databases or multiple database servers. It allows you to set the username and password individually per server. Um, so if, if you have that environment, this second call is what you can use. And in general, it, it's just going to be one line of code that you need to bring in there um, uh, to change the username and password on those. So um, next up on the advanced connection handling side, here we have uh, where should I change my connection settings. If you're doing this stuff, all of this should be an uninitialized report. And the, the connection handling is one area of Flex to Crystal where there, there are some changes from the RDC. Um, in general, a lot of what you're doing is going to be compatible and, and should just work. Um, but the connection handling in, the, in Crystal Reports 2011 has just been changed overall. Uh, for instance, they allow you to uh, access the, uh, the connections via something called the, the report application server, which is something that we're going to look at a little bit later. Um, and they allow you to change connection settings globally or on a table-by-table -table basis, or there, there's all these different methods to change it. And um, although we've added compatibility for most of what was in the old RDC stuff, some things are truly different. For instance, some users um, were using a connection stream, and that is now gone. There, there isn't really support in Crystal Reports 2011 for that. So we've gotten, uh, you know, there, there are a few users that have really had to go in and, and change maybe their class that handles dynamic connections uh, to work with uh, the new uh, Flex to Crystal package. But in general, that's just changing. Uh, that one class, and then they're good to go for the entire thing. So next up on the advanced connection handling, um, we have this environment where you're accessing multiple database servers. And we actually have some code that is in the quick start guide. And we will switch over and take a look at that. Um, that allows you to change the connection on a table by table basis, and in fact, I have it up in this report here. This is the code right here. So basically what we're doing here, this, this is a, a bit of code that you have to go through here, but what we're doing, um, and this is in the quick start guide, so you can um, uh, take it out of there and, and apply it into your application, but what we're doing here is we're actually um, uh, looping over all of the tables in the report. And in this case, we're looking for tables that are based on ADO, um, which is uh, what most of yours are going to be if you're using OLEDB, for instance, on your, uh, in um, your crystal reports. And uh, we go through here, and we literally change the connections uh, by doing the send comat on a connection properties object that we create. So we have to go out, create a connection property object, uh, and find link, link that to the table, and then we change the settings on that object to link it to a different database in this case. So, um, for instance, if I were to, let's, let's take a look at how this works. If I remark this out and go ahead and run this report, Oh, let's pick 
Uh, let's pick Florida, actually. I think I've got it set up to win Florida. Okay, you can see on here, um, if I zoom in a bit here, which width. First item here listed is access miles. This is just a, a standard report that we have here. So just take note of that access miles there. Then we're going to go in and we are going to remark this code back in and rerun it. Uh, you'll notice that it lists, instead of access miles, this is a different DB. So we've changed, in this case, we didn't change the server I'm linking to, but I do have multiple databases set up on that server. And we linked this report dynamically to a different database. So, um, and, and literally, the, the code is that simple. This is copied right out of the quick start guide. And all I did was I came in on these two lines. Initial catalog is your database. and uh, uh, the DSN is the database server. And so literally I do that, um, which is uh, identical. This, this code is actually identical to what you would do in the older RDC interface. Um, the only line that's really different here is, is that we're checking the table type and also this one line here to apply that logon info. So after we change it in the old uh, RDC interface, it automatically changed because those were the only settings that you could change. In um, Crystal Reports 2011, there's actually a whole bunch of other settings that you can change. And so basically you have to wait until you've changed whatever you want and then tell it to apply those. Um, otherwise, if, if it tried to do it on its own, uh, it, it could end up in a bad state if you were looking to change other things also. So you have to make sure you, you call this one line here. And of course, that's in the uh, um, Quick Start Guide. And we are going to pull up the quick start guide for the, let's just switch back here. You'll notice uh, at the bottom I mentioned that for Oracle, the code is a little different. Um, and this is, this is actually not anything related to Flex to Crystal. Uh, there is a bug in Crystal Reports 2011 that causes a, an issue with Oracle specifically. And so we actually went out and, and uh, found a fix for that and let me just show it to you. Uh, I'm not going to link to a Oracle server but I will pull up the quick start guide and show you where it is. Okay so let's fit with here. Okay so for an Oracle connection um, uh, you can actually see that the, the code on the Oracle side is, is a little bit simpler. Um, and what we're doing here, uh, if you use the other method on Oracle uh, server, for some reason it, it messes up the schema associated with the report. Um, and uh, basically it, it just completely fails. Um, doesn't work at all. So uh, what we actually are doing here um, is You'll notice here we access re report document is something that uh, if you've looked at Crystal Reports 2008 or 2011, it's it's the main report equivalent to the uh, C Crystal Report class in RDC. We're accessing a different class here though called Report Client Document, and this is actually part of the um, the RAS interface or Report Application Server interface. This was something that in uh, prior versions of Crystal, you actually needed a different license to access even, um, but it's included in uh, Crystal Reports 2011. And uh, so we're able to go in and basically access some of the internal structure of the report here. And what we do is, again, we loop over the tables and we use this other call, com set table location by server database name. That, that is actually the name of the call, very long function name there or procedure name, and uh, we pass it the name of the table, and we pass it 
in this case the server and the username and password that we're going to. Um, Oracle databases don't really have a, a database name that you pass them at all, so that's actually a blank parameter in this case. But this changes the username and password without blowing up the schema. And so if you have an Oracle connection, instead of using that code, you'll use this. We have it in the Quick Start Guide so that you can access it. Okay. Next item here, how can I verify the tables in my report? And uh, uh, this, again, is uh, something where we access the RAS interface. Um, there is, um, you, if, if you look through the Flex to Crystal classes, you'll notice that there actually is a verify table or a verify tables call um, that is available in Flex to Crystal. This is different than the call that is in the RDC interface, though. Um, the main difference is that the verify table um, that is built in right now, what it does basically is it just verifies the connection. So it makes sure that you have a valid connection to your database server. Um, this is different than what you expect verify tables to do. You, you guys may be familiar with a, a certain utility that, that does a verify tables. And um, what it does is it updates the schema. If, for instance, your, uh, your table has uh, a field that got longer, for instance, uh, or um, added a field or something like that, um, basically the report could generate an error when you go to run it if you have a, a situation like this. And so there's a utility out there to do a mass verify, um, but some users also do it on a report by report basis. Uh, the equivalent of that is um, based on the report client document interface now uh, inside of the report application server. There is still a way of doing this, and we're going to take a look at that. I think I have it in this report right under here. So it's very simple code. That That's it right there. So in this case, what we do is, again, we get a link to this report client document object. And then we send verify database off of this one. And um, in this case, this verify database will go out and it will make sure that the schema for that database and for all the tables um, that you reference in your report that access that database is up to date. So if there's any schema changes, those can actually be dealt with at runtime now. So uh, what that ends up doing is if you have this situation where there is a change, there's actually the possibility of not having to uh, do a mass verify on the report beforehand. It can be done at runtime. Um, and uh, of course, there's possibility of errors in this case if, if it's uh, if the change is large enough that it breaks the report for some reason, for instance, changing a string type field to an integer field that then has, you know, um, substring based stuff off of it, or or vice versa, changing an integer to a string field and and uh, and doing integer operations on it, um, that of course could still generate an error. But in this case, you're able to do a verify at runtime, and so you may not need to use that mass verify in this case. So very simple code that you can add in there that does that for you. It does not save the scheme updates in this case. You can tell it to go in and save uh, the report, and you do that same way you've done it uh, in the RDC interface. But this is doing a runtime update of the schema. So cool new feature there, actually. OK. Next up, we're going to spend some time talking about the SAP licensing. So we're done. We're done looking at uh, uh, the VDS side of things with Flex Crystal. We're going to talk about licensing and deployment now, and and then we will get back to some of the cool new features actually in part two. So in relation to the the SAP licensing, in prior versions of Crystal Reports, there were there are actually quite a few different license schemes. And SAP has, has made this simpler, but in fact, um, really, it, it, it's kind of clear as mud right now, uh, the way this stands. So let me, let me try and compress this all down into something reasonable. Crystal Reports 2011 is uh, a 
named user license for developers. So you are able, you need to have a license for every named developer. Uh, it doesn't necessarily have to be per machine, but it has to be per developer uh, for Crystal Reports. There is only one edition of this now. There isn't a developer edition um, uh, like there was before. There is a server edition and there is the Crystal Reports 2011 license designer, uh, which is this named user license. Um, this license does not include a runtime engine, period. When you go to install it, there is no runtime engine. That's one of the reasons Flux Crystal checks that you have uh, the runtime engine we need. There are multiple runtime engines available. Um, for Flex to Crystal, we're using the Visual Studio runtime engine, Visual Studio 2010. Um, there is also a Java runtime engine available, and um, there is a web-based runtime engine available also. Um, but these runtime engines are something that you have to download separately and distribute with your product. Uh, now, you do not need to buy anything from SAP other than your developer named user licenses to distribute Crystal Reports. You can distribute them with the Visual Studio 2010 runtime uh, free uh, other than your buying your developer license. Um, you no longer, before, if you were going to access, for instance, the report application server features in Crystal, you needed to purchase for, for each site a developer edition of Crystal Reports and, and data access uh, used to sell it that way with a developer edition. You no longer uh, have to do that. There is an exception though. Um, Crystal Reports Server, which lets you do web applications, um, also has a license for Citrix and Terminal Server. So, what I said before about being able to distribute on an unlimited basis is true if you are distributing to workstations. If you are distributing to terminal servers or Citrix servers, they consider that a crystal server license rather than just a runtime license, even though you will not be installing the crystal server on that Citrix server most likely. Um, their license terms require that you have a crystal server for that. Now, the Crystal server is, uh, I believe right now it runs about $2,500. Um, but the, the nice part about it is that it is an unlimited redistribution license for that. So you do not need one of these for every single site. You need one of them. Uh, if, and so if, if you don't have any customers that are using Citrix or terminal servers, um, you can just have your developer uh, edition of Crystal, or excuse me, just the standard Crystal Reports 2011 license, which is a um, uh, $495 license. I think it's $295 new some, or, uh, for an upgrade. Um, and then just distribute off of that um, from the SAP side of things, and that's all you need. On the Citrix terminal server, if you have those, you do need to get this Crystal server license. It's a one-time purchase and allows you to redistribute. Um, both versions, like I mentioned, are unlimited distribution. And uh, the one other um, caveat in this is in relation to commercial hosting. If you are doing commercial hosting um, uh, of sites for customers, kind of um, uh, software as a service type of setups, uh, you do need an OEM contract directly with SAP to do that. Uh, so they view that as a special circumstance also. And in fact, if we go take a look, just want to show you guys what this is like here. Uh, we're go right in here. I have, uh, here we go, SAP Crystal Solutions Licensing. This is for the current license scheme, and but it goes over older versions of Crystal and newer versions of Crystal, and um, it, it's a 22-page document. Um, so uh, they have made it simpler. This document's going over some of the 
uh, older pieces related to it. Um, but you'll notice as we go through here that there are sections related to dealing with terminal services and Citrix services. Um, they've changed the names of the products. Uh, of course, they've added SAP since they were acquired uh, by SAP uh, to the names. But they've also changed names of some of the other pieces of the product. So as you're going through here and looking at the licensing, some of that has changed. And they have different sections on redistribution, tables related to how it works for the different versions of Crystal. So, uh, you know, they, it, it's, it's a pretty detailed little setup here. Um, so there, uh, there's quite a bit in here that you may want to look at. And of course, uh, if you, we, we'd be happy to send this document to you. It's freely available on their website. Um, but it can be a little difficult to find some things on SAP's website. So I've actually saved down quite a few of the different documents you may need um, uh, to go over. And, uh, but there, there's all kinds of stuff. When you get into the web applications and Citrix servers, there's also stuff related to um, concurrent access with some of these things. And so um, there's special situations there to deal with. And of course, um, you can you can uh, get crystal reports through Mertec. Uh, so, you know, if you have questions about this, uh, you're welcome to give us a call and, and uh, uh, Mary or Riaz will be able to help you with, uh, with going through what your exact situation may be. So that's the SAP side of things. On the Flex Crystal side of things, um, our developer license is also based on a named user basis. And uh, uh, for details on how the licensing is set up, just, just give us a call. Um, we're, we're kind of uh, uh, doing licensing based on, on your specific needs right now. So just give us a call and we can go over um, uh, what your specific situation is. So next up, we are going to look at the final piece of this, which is deployment. Deployment is super simple. Um, Basically, uh, you have to have that Crystal runtime installed that Flex Crystal installs. And in fact, um, there is a, uh, a link to the exact file that you'll need for that um, uh, to download and put in there. And uh, we have that link that, uh, that we can give you. It's not on this slide, but uh, I can send it to anyone that needs it. Um, it's not too hard to find. It's the um, CR for VS redistribution license, in fact. I think if I switch over here. OK. Um, you'll see right here, we have access to, uh, th this is a, uh, a link. Um, that has all of the different uh, versions of Crystal Reports 2010. Right now, uh, uh, Flex Crystal is based on Support Pack 1. So you need either the, uh, actually you'll need just the redistributable install for 32-bit. And if you have your own installations right on this page here, um, you also have access to merge modules for it. So if you have an installer that allows you to use MSMs, uh, you can integrate this uh, you can integrate this directly and, and just use a merged module instead. Um, so this can be a hard to find page. The address is here. I can send it to everybody separately and uh, in the follow up to, uh, to the uh, webinar here, we'll send this along with a couple other links uh, to everyone so you have uh, access to some of these other items here. So uh, you'll need that, that runtime piece of it. In addition to that, um, You'll need to copy the files from the Flex Crystal bin folder into the target folder. And of course, um, there you're going to have your developer um, license file. So you'll need your distribution license file, of course, that'll go into the target folder. And literally, there's just this, uh, this one regASM, uh, which is to register a, an assembly. It's kind of like the equivalent of regSVR32, but for .NET assemblies. Um, and so you call that on Flex Crystal after you have the uh, runtime installed, and uh, that's about it. So if we go take a look over here, the files that you'll need are these files here. So 
just those files. There's, I think, six or seven files there, eight files maybe, yeah, eight files. Um, those need to be copied over. The FlexCrystal DLL needs to be, you run that RegASM on it, um, which is in the uh, Quick Start Guide also. And then, of course, this is our developer license. In this case, uh, since I'm a new setup, I'm, I'm just on a uh, trial license right now. Um, but you're going to copy in your uh, distribution mds.flexcrystal.cfg and uh, run that regASM, and that's about it. Um, on the flip side of things, in relation to that, there there is also uh, a couple other means by which you can register the FlexCrystal DLL. Um, the regASM is actually a console-based um, executable. If your installer allows you to register assemblies, um, you should use that instead. Some installers do, some don't. That's why we give you the command line here. Um, so if you have the ability to, to do that in your installer, of course, that gets rid of the, the whole uh, folder issue. And uh, uh, But otherwise, you can use this. You can also just push registry keys in. Uh, RegASM basically is just registering the control in the registry, and there's ways you can do that also. So. Um, uh, and in the next version of flex to crystal we will probably actually be giving you some documentation on doing that and using uh, this other means ourselves too. So, um, but that's literally it. Copy those files, run the regASM, and you're deployed on a target machine. Um, so deployment is super simple. Um, in uh, the cases that we test, what, what we do, um, is we copy all of those folders from, or all those files from the bin folder just into the same location where the program is located. You could do a subfolder off of that if you wanted to, um, or something else. It doesn't, it doesn't really matter much. Um, but we just copy it right, right where our program is and run the regASM, and, uh, and we're good to go on that side of things. So that's deployment. That's all there is to it. So. Just want to do a quick review on what we went over. Uh, of course, went over installing the prerequisites. We added the library to the workspace. Got to make sure you do that. Uh, of course, uh, in between there, you may want to um, run the uh, uh, the test report. And of course, make sure you look at the test report. It has lots of useful uh, pieces of code in there. Um, so, you know, if you want to do any of those things, test report's a great place to look. It also, of course. Uh, gives you a, a um, the designs that you need to, to implement CDO and uh, ADAO.net is in there too. And of course, uh, then you convert your report. Very simple three-step process. You have to use the statements at the top, include those, um, and uh, you can do that even with a with the search and replace rename. And uh, then, of course, for distribution, you have to install the runtime, copy the files to the deployment folder, and run the regASM. That's beginning to end with Flex to Crystal. Um, for part two uh, of the training, we're going to go over a lot of the new features um, that are available in Flex to Crystal. Uh, we're going to go over things like parameters, uh, multilingual setups. Uh, we're going to go through ADO.net in detail, actually building a report from scratch with ADO.net on a, on a test workspace. And uh, uh, we're just going to get a lot more in depth. Uh, this, this part of it was meant to get you guys started. And uh, hopefully, you've been able to convert a report along with us here. Um, so that's about all we have. Does anybody have any questions? I'm going to stay on the line for a few minutes. If you have any questions, uh, if there's anything you missed along the way, I'd be happy to answer those now.
Okay, so we have a question here uh, from Todd. After sending the ComVerify method, is there a way to know if changes were made? Um, with this method, there isn't. It will report back errors, but in general, this just updates the, the schema if there were changes and allows the report to continue running. Um, so I, I don't know of a method uh, right now that's available in CRISPR reports 2011 that will actually report back if there were changes. Uh, it just will tell you if there were changes that it couldn't fix on its own. Um, so uh, the the deal with this is that the other thing to note here is that when you do a verify, um, if there's information related to the username and password that's needed to log into the database server, um, that needs to be done before you run the verify so that it can actually go out and grab that information. A good way of crashing crystal in uh, crystal reports 2011 just in general is to run the uh, com verify method without pushing uh, a username and password to the report first uh, it kind of gets lost doesn't know what to do with it so um, that's one little note there you need to make sure that you pass that information along so that it can actually complete it and here we go um, Todd also mentions that, that it may be a good idea to save after afterwards, and uh, uh, that's very true. A good reason to know if the schema did change is so that you could save it. Um, the and this is something that truly has changed from the RDC side of things, um, and I believe the reason behind it is to get rid of this whole concept behind mass verify. Um, instead of going through and doing a mass verify and uh, then saving all the ones that have changed, what, what they're advising here is instead of needing to do that, you essentially, um, you essentially just run this as part of your regular report running and it'll go out and do the verify and if it's changed, it updates it really, really fast. In fact, if we were to go in and, uh, and run that code, Actually, we can leave in both. I don't think it really matters at all. Um, if we go in and run that, it doesn't take any amount of time longer to, to run with the verify than it does with that. So I think they're trying to get away from that concept in general so that basically you just do the verify and um, you know go about your business, so to speak, with it. And it handles all of that for you. Um, so that, you know, I, I think that's what they're getting at with this. Um, there, there is most likely a way of doing it inside the RAS. We, I haven't looked that deeply into the uh, into it to, to get to an answer on detecting that. Um, I know it will report errors, though, if, if there's something that it can't change. So either you have to always save if you do that and, and resave every report or, um, or just have it run at runtime. Okay, well, looks like we don't have, uh, have any other questions coming through right now, so we're going to wrap this up. I uh, want to thank everyone for attending, uh, and uh, we will see you soon for the Flex to Crystal training part two using the new features of Crystal Reports, and uh, that one's going to be quite a bit uh, uh, more in-depth look at, at some of these newer items in Crystal Reports. We wanted to get you guys set up, first of all, and uh, like I had mentioned, we're going to look at parameters. Uh, we're going to look at using ADO.net, the replacement to CDO. Uh, we're going to look at uh, some multilingual features that have been added into Crystal Reports to make it a little bit more enterprise aware, and uh, and quite a few other items along the way. So we're going to touch all the stuff that maybe you guys haven't had as much exposure to then. So I uh, hope to see you guys all, all back here for that, and thank you for attending. <laughs>